people with MS are excited about Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, a new disease-modifying therapy to treat MS, which could be better and safer than existing drugs. But one drug in this class has the most hype, and that's phenobrutinib due to its high selectivity. And we'll take a look at this drug closely and clinical trials done so far, including a phase two randomized trial in relapsing MS and ongoing phase three trials in relapsing and progressive MS. And what about the risk of liver injury? And here are some timestamps if you want to skip ahead. And this drug isn't available yet, but remember what the Boy Scouts say, be prepared. So as a background, many people with MS are doing great, but others, both with progressive MS and even early relapsing MS, experience a subtle, slow worsening of symptoms over time. Part of this may be because although our disease-modifying therapies work on lymphocytes, the B and T cells, part of the adaptive immune system, a different component of the immune system called the innate immune system, the part we're born with, may be driving smoldering inflammation in progressive MS. For instance, this autopsy study shows central nervous system microglia in chronic active lesions in inactive progressive MS. In other words, even in inactive progressive MS, there's some subtle inflammation, and there's evidence this is present early in relapsing MS, even in people with low disability, and it may be the cause of PIRA, progression independent of relapse activity. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, and I report no financial conflict of interest. So let's back up and talk about Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors in general. Tyrosine kinase, what is that? Well, tyrosine is is an amino acid, a component of a protein. Kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphorus to a protein. And so a tyrosine kinase enzyme adds a phosphorus group to the tyrosine amino acid, and it's used in cell signaling pathways. And I'll show you a diagram on the next slide. This pathway is in a lot of different cells throughout the body. Notably, it's in mast cells, part of the allergy system, microglia and macrophages, part of the innate immune system, which again may be driving smoldering inflammation in MS, and B lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies. Of course, B cells are the targets of various disease-modifying therapies in MS, rituximab, ocrevus, casimta, and briemde. It doesn't kill these cells. This pathway regulates the survival, migration, and proliferation of these cells, sort of down down regulates them when this pathway is inhibited. This is also in gastrointestinal cells, which may be why there's potential for GI side effects. We know that BTKIs reduce memory B cells, the B cells that recognize antigens they're familiar with. And we know BTKIs reduce cytokines, which are immune cell signaling proteins and integrin receptors on B cells, such as VLA4. This is the target of the drug Tysabri, which is used to treat MS. This diagram shows a tyrosine tyrosine kinase pathway in a B lymphocyte. You can see the B cell receptor on the cell membrane. It receives a signal, sets off a chain of events, including Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And so a BTKI, an inhibitor of this, will block this signal and prevent it from occurring, which will normally change the transcription of DNA. In other words, changing the DNA into messenger RNA and eventually translation into protein. And so a BTKI will influence DNA expression within these immune cells. There are many different BTKIs, including some well-known drugs. Mesitinib, which has been studied in MS and is currently approved to treat mast cell tumors in dogs, trade name Massivet. Gleevec, imatinib, one of the most famous drugs of all time, the original designer drug to treat chronic myelogenous leukemia, life-changing for some people with that condition. And BTKIs studied in MS, including tolibrutinib, evabrutinib, and of course, this video will focus on phenobrutinib. And many people think BTKIs may be better than drugs that deplete B cells. Again, drugs like Ocrevus and Casimta. One, they seem to have a lower risk of weakening the immune system and causing infections, at least based on data we have so far. Also, one problem with B cell depleters is the effect is very prolonged. I have patients who last received one of these medications over a year ago, and they still have low antibody levels. They're still having infections from it, and I wish I could just give them back their immune system, but sometimes it takes 
takes a very long time, whereas BTKIs have a much faster offset. Of course, this could be disadvantageous in certain situations. Let's say you're changing health insurance. It's nice for a doctor to be able to tell a patient, you're good for a while, just eventually get a new neurologist. Also, even though BTKIs are less potent immunosuppressants, they could actually be more effective at smoldering multiple sclerosis due to differential effects on the innate immune system as I discussed previously. So let's focus on phenobutanib. This is an oral reversible BTKI. It's oral, it's a pill. It's reversible, meaning that it binds using hydrogen bonds to the enzyme tyrosine kinase. It does not form covalent bonds. So hydrogen bonds are sort of like cellophane on a plate, you can peel it off, whereas gluing something to the plate would be like a hydrogen bond, it forms a new molecule. And you can see it forms hydrogen bonds to these specific amino acid residues of the kinase. Now that may make it not last as long, and so is it really a once a day pill? More on that later. The same drug is being studied in other immune related conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and hives, chronic urticaria. The half-life is fairly short, only four to 10 hours. Again, is it really a once a day pill? Now people like this drug because it's quite selective. It has limited effects on other kinases. Specifically, it does not bind HER2 human epidermal growth factor, which is thought to relate to heart toxicity in other similar drugs. And also it does not affect other kinases, which could suppress T cells. So hopefully the effect is only on B lymphocytes, macrophages, microglia, and perhaps mast cells. Let's take a look at the clinical trials references in the notes below. We'll start with this phase one trial or pilot trial in healthy adults, people without multiple sclerosis, just to make sure the drug is safe. They found that the half-life, again, is around 4 to 10 hours of the drug, and they used a lower dose, only 100 milligrams once daily, and they believe, based on their testing, that this alone was expected to maintain a high level of Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibition over the dosing interval, and they reported no serious adverse events, though this was a very small study. Next, we'll move to the Fentopa Phase two trial. Keep in mind the data you're about to see have not yet been published. What you're about to see are photographs of slides taken at a professional conference, Ectrams, by Dr. Barry Singer, but the data should be accurate. So this is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and so people did not know if they were getting phenobutanib or placebo. They did two-to-one randomization, meaning twice as many people were getting phenobutanib as placebo, and this is to encourage people to enter the trial because a lot of people don't want to take the risk of getting placebo. And they used a higher dose, 200 milligrams orally twice daily. So four times the dose we saw in the pilot trial versus placebo is a short study, only 12 weeks. And so you'll see the primary endpoint is actually MRI activity because there's not a lot of clinical progression and relapses in a three month period within MS. They had 119 adults in the study and these are people with relapsing MS age 18 to 55. And they looked for people who had signs of inflammatory activity. So you had to have more than two or two or more relapses within the last two years or one relapse within the last one year, and you had to have at least one gadolinium enhancing lesion on MRI within six months of entering the study. These are common inclusion criteria in relapsing MS trials. This is the primary endpoint, new gadolinium enhancing or active lesions. You can see phenobutanib in blue versus placebo in gray, and they looked at combined MRIs at week four, week eight, and week 12 after the start of the study, and you can see overall there was a 69% reduction reduction in active lesions, highly statistically significant p-value 0.0022. And you may say this isn't that great, certainly not as effective as B-cell depleting drugs. However, there seems to be some therapeutic lag. If you look at just week four, there was only a 22% reduction. So it's really not effective for the first month. But then later on, week eight and week 12, there was a 92% and 90% reduction. Pretty good, though maybe not quite as good as 
as B-cell depleting drugs, which were even more effective in their clinical trials. There was a sub-study looking at spinal taps to measure central nervous system penetration, and 11 people agreed we bowed down to those who had a voluntary spinal tap just to contribute to science. And they found that the average fenibrutinib cerebrospinal fluid level was a 43.1 nanograms per milliliter, which seems small. A nanogram is one billionth of a gram, but they claim that in 11 out of 11 individuals, it suggested sufficient central nervous system concentration to have a biological effect. I don't have the expertise to comment on this. Next, we'll look at the side effects reported in the Fentopa trial. They say there were no serious adverse events, but I guess it depends on what you mean by serious. There were actually two grade three adverse events, both for elevated liver enzymes on blood testing, though they were asymptomatic. They did require hospitalization due to the blood test, but they didn't have clinical symptoms of liver failure and apparently had a good outcome as far as I know. I don't know the full details. There were other adverse events which were grade two or lower, such as elevated liver enzymes, though not as severe, abdominal pain and nausea, again, GI side effects as anticipated, headache and allergy to the drug itself. There were an equal number of infections in the fenibrutinib and placebo arms, which is reassuring, but again, this is a very short study, only three months. We can't comment on long-term risk of infections. We'll learn more about fenibrutinib as there are numerous ongoing trials. For instance, the Fentopa trial has an open label extension. People will know they're getting the drug. It won't be blinded, but we'll see how people People do? Will they start getting infections? Is the risk of liver injury just early on or can it occur at any time? There are also two trials in relapsing MS, both randomized trials against Abagio. This is a low efficacy pill for multiple sclerosis. These trials are called Fenhance 1 and 2. They're using a once daily dose of fenibrutinib. What happened to twice a day? I'm not exactly sure why. And Abagio is considered lower in efficacy, so I I think fenibrutinib will have to defeat Abagio in order for this trial to be significant and make people want to take the drug. The estimated completion date is November 2025. More interesting, in my opinion, is the fentrepid trial. Fenibrutinib, again, just once daily, I'm not sure why, versus Ocrevus in primary progressive MS, ages 18 to 65. So we'll see how this works in older people with MS, which is very important because many older people have a significant risk of serious infection with drugs like Ocrevus, and we need better data in older people with MS. And even if fenibrutinib were just equal in efficacy to Ocrevus, if it were safer in terms of risk of infections, that would probably be a better drug. Of course, we'll also have to look at the risk of liver injury. The estimated completion date is December 2026, so we'll have to look out for these drugs on the market in around 2027. So that's all I have. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I do think fenibrutinib is promising, though we'll have to see what these phase three trials show, particularly the clinical outcome of disability progression, something very important to people with MS. We'll see if it's true that it can stop smoldering multiple sclerosis. We just don't know yet. And hopefully the risk of liver injury isn't too significant. I'd be interested to know your thoughts on fenibrutinib. Would you take this drug? Would you enter a clinical trial? Have you entered a clinical trial for one of the BTKIs? And what is your experience? And let me know if you have suggestions for future videos.